Okay, well, we're going to go to Genesis. I guess we'll go to Genesis 1. That's a good place, right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Um, if, you're, if you're having trouble with where that is, go to the very front cover and start turning, turning toward the back, and eventually you'll hit Genesis way sooner than later, okay? Um, now, for those of us who've been in church for years or have, have studied the Bible, if I say turn to Genesis, it's like, that's easy, right? We, we know right where that is. That's probably the easiest one to find. Maybe Revelation would be the other. Um, but I'll tell you, in our society today, um, and I've, I've, I've observed this with our academy students, um, we are studying through Genesis as well in our academy with our middle school. And I said, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. And there were a handful who just kind of, you know how you do when you don't, you, they kind of opened it up and they were just kind of leafing through it. And um, one thing we do in our Bible class is we teach them right off the bat, like, hey, everybody, including Pastor Keller, is still learning God's Word. So there's no shame in any questions that anybody has, because even Pastor Keller still has a lot of questions about the Bible, okay? And I tell them, I don't care if it's the most basic thing that you think everybody in the room probably knows. If you don't understand, please say something, because I would rather you know it than to pretend like you know it and not really grasp what's going on. And um, as young people are, they tend to be a little bit uh, less afraid and less intimidated than sometimes we adults are, and they do a great job at that. So sometimes they'll raise their hand and say, can you help me find this? Um, even sometimes in Genesis, if I'm like, we're in Genesis 7 today, you know, they'll be like, is that verse 7? or It's great. Uh, I love it because you've got people who are interested in trying to get in there and find out what God has to say. And I know it's not probably legal or whatever, but I would love to record a, a one of our classes just so you could get a peek at some of the questions that 6th and 7th grade young people are asking about God's Word. Because I would venture to say that there's some of the questions we even still ask, and I love it when I have to tell a student, that's a really good question, I'll have to look at that and find out and get back to you on it. That is wonderful. Because it's not a surface type thing, it's their, their mind is engaged, and they're wondering, there's a curiosity there. And we talk about being curious and and asking the question, why? That's a, that's a great question to ask. Um, and so we, we talked to them about that. But there, to me, I, I don't know if it's just my personal thing or I don't know what it is about it for me. But when I see someone come to the Word of God and they are experiencing it for the first time, it, it's such a rewarding thing. I, I don't know. Seeing them see it for the first time just does your heart good. It's refreshing because you, you begin to have that kind of wonder again. You know, you, you, can, you can resonate with their wonder, and it takes you to a place of, yeah, God, you know, there, I still have to, lots of questions I still have to ask and don't, don't have the first idea about you, Lord, and I'm trying, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, love it, love it, love it. And so it's a great, great opportunity for us. But Genesis 1, for us, that should be a softball. Um, I printed out tonight four pages of a, of a paper that I wrote for my Old Testament history class about the author of Genesis. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Now, I, did, I even have footnotes, man, all right? This is really good stuff. So, actual in Turabian format. I mean, I'm really proud of this. It means nothing to you, but it's, I'm really proud of it. I'll read you the first sentence, and... Tell me if you think you're ready for the rest of it or if you find it fascinating. Here's my first sentence. Due to the enlightened period, as Hill sarcastically places quotation marks around the word, a critical approach was taken to biblical study that emerged from a humanistic and evolutionary standpoint. Snoozer, right? So tonight I found out that our kids across the, the driveway here, they're actually starting in Genesis as well. And so I was talking to some of the teachers, Ange, Angie and Abby were uh, talking about their lesson tonight a little bit earlier, and they said, yeah, we're starting in Genesis. I said, so am I. So I tried out my line on them. I said, what do you think about starting that with the kids tonight? You know, how do you think they'll respond to that? And, and Abby assured me, 
that her first and third grade, first through third graders would love that, and they would probably grow much from, from hearing that first line. It's a snoozer. It really is. But here's why I brought this uh, paper in, not just to brag on my ability to do good footnotes. There is this common belief among what I would call Bible believers that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, that he's responsible for writing it down. There is what is called, um, during the Enlightened period, and, and the, you know, the author did put quotation marks around that because he's laughing at or being sarcastic about the fact that enlightened people take the Word of God and they strip down all that the Word of God says um, you know, inherently, that is internal evidence and even external evidence, and they break it all down and say, no, 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 let's reconstruct what really happened. And we call that foolishness, right? Um, God is, is very plain in the way that he does things. And I argue, both in my paper and in my studies, and I think you would probably agree with me, that there's a lot of internal, meaning that you can look at Genesis and see it, and external evidence, meaning you can look at other books of the Bible and see it, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis outside of internal evidence in Genesis, there is, of course, the words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus himself said, Moses wrote, and then Jesus quoted Genesis. Um, John 5, 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me, okay? Mark 12, 19, someone said to Jesus, Master, Moses wrote unto us, and these were all references to things found in the book of Genesis. So I, I think that I'm in good company tonight to say that if Jesus says it, we don't question it, right? We just, it's the truth. Uh, whether I believe it or not, it's the truth. And Jesus has said that Moses wrote this. So I can stop there and I'm fine. I don't have to go into critical theory and study and and enlightenment. I can just know that there's only one who's truly enlightened. That's the Lord Jesus. He gets it. In fact, he authored it. He spoke it into, into existence. So we have it on good authority that, that Moses wrote Genesis. So I can stop there. If you want to get into the weeds of it, you can Google it, but it'll make your head hurt. We'll just take Jesus' word for it. So Moses, we're going to say Moses wrote the book of Genesis and when we start here, uh, we, we understand that, that in Genesis, especially in the very beginning of the book, we get all we need to know about the universe. And that is vitally important because in our world today, in our culture, especially Western culture, we're trying to take everything that we have known either intrinsically or by evidence in creation about God and we take it and we reverse it and say, no, we know something different. We know something better. And so what is written here cannot be what really took place. All kinds of theories, right? The theory of evolution. Question. How often do you hear it referred to as the theory of evolution in mainstream media and television programs? Usually they don't put theory in front of it because a theory is a guess. It's an idea. And famously, when Bill Nye the science guy said to Ken Ham, I might be able to believe it if there was a book, Ken Ham retorted, there is a book. And whether we choose to believe it or not, that's to our blessing or detriment. But God has recorded it for us. Um, so we have here the evidence, all that we need, who wrote it, and what he's talking about here. Verse number one, we could probably all quote it from memory. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So there, just in those two verses, we could spend weeks just talking about the content there. You can stop at, in the beginning, God. Four words. 
You can stop after the fourth word of the Bible and you have the foundation of everything. In the beginning, as we know it, God. God doesn't have a beginning. God has always been. Very difficult concept for you and me because we're not God, because our ways are not His ways. Our thoughts are, are not His thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are much higher than our ways, as Isaiah said. So for you and I, this concept of in the beginning, God had to put it in terms that you and I could get because we don't attain into His thinking. In the beginning, God, period. You could, but He continues with created the heaven and the earth. So in my opinion, the way I look at this, uh, what, what Moses is writing here is in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and here comes the record of all that God created. Some people would say, well, that could suggest a gap theory, okay? Um, I, I, I lean toward the literal day uh, theories because of what Jesus, or what the Bible calls here in Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, some would say, true, but what did they mean by evening and morning? Well, I would say that while there are things in the Bible that you and I maybe not, do not grasp the full meaning of. I think we have to admit that. I think there are places where the Bible makes very emphatic statements where God says things in a way that are relatable to human thinking, like an evening and a morning. He put it in terms we can get. I believe that God did that to make it plain. It, and to some of us, it seems too plain, right? Sometimes plain things seem so simple, that can't be all there is. But why not? Why not? I would say salvation is one of those simple, plain things that people stumble over because it's so simple, don't they? They, they want to earn heaven. They want to earn God's uh, grace, which goes against the very definition of the word grace, unmerited favor, right? You can't earn it. It's given. And so, the, the doctrine of salvation, the teaching of grace and faith in Jesus, very simple, but it's a stumbling block to those who would try to make more out of it than God has. So sometimes we make more out of something than God's meaning, and sometimes God means more than we read about it. And so how do you determine which is which? Well, all I can say is I'm not an authority on the subject. I, I, don't, I don't have as many years as many people in this room who are studying the Bible. So here's kind of what I've picked up to this point. When I take time to pray as I read through the Scripture, and I'm truly seeking God and asking Him to, to reveal the truth to me, it's not that always this light bulb comes on in that moment and the answer just pops off the page. Sometimes that happens. But a lot of times it's God using His Word in different places or different people speaking it to us where He brings that truth to us. See, God's going to bring the truth to it. His Holy Spirit, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to reveal truth to us. And as believers, and when Jesus taught parables, what did He say? Some of these things, some people aren't going to get them because they just, they just want a surface thought. They, they just want a surface idea of what I'm talking about. But the people who really want to know, the people who are going to dive in, it'll be revealed. And it might take time. It, it, it will take effort. And it may take others. But some of these things can be understood and learned if we'll take the time. So God created the heaven and the earth. Now think about verse 2. I've never thought about it like this until I, I really just kind of imagined what verse 2 says looked like. So it says, And the earth was without form, had no shape. Now we know from images from outer space, we can see that the, the earth looks almost perfectly round. It's, it's, a, it's a terrestrial ball, as the song says, okay? It, it's a a round globe that we look at. We, we understand these things, but when it was first created, it was without form. 
It was void, empty. Um, it, it, so you got this blob of what? It says, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we have this blob of liquid with no real form. It's kind of empty. The word that we get here in the Hebrew is chaos. It was absolute chaos. Just this thing that God spoke in, this blob of liquid that is just formless, and there's chaos, and then something happens. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, moved, breathed, brought life upon the face of the waters. So in other words, something's happening. Something's going on with what God has started. The first thing that God says that we have recorded is verse 3. And God said, let there be light. Very first thing that we know that, we know that God said. Let there be light. Well, when God says something, it happens. Look at the rest of the verse. And there was light. It speaks to God's power, doesn't it? It speaks to the power of God. That He just says it, and it happens. Let there be light, light. This is the power of our God. And if God can speak light into existence, there's pr probably not much anything else He can't do. If He can just say it and it happens. Verse 4, And God saw the light, and this is a phrase that's repeated over and over, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Because there was darkness. And light always extinguishes darkness, not the other way around. Darkness cannot overcome light. Jesus uses that example several times in teachings in the Gospels. God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness. So where we are right now, we read about this blob of liquid that God spoke into existence. The Spirit of God is moving on the face of the waters. God says, let there be light. And now there's light. God says, that's good. He divides the light from darkness. And verse 5 tells us, God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. Day and night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Day one, light. Light and darkness uh, around this blob of liquid that the Spirit of God is moving on. Something's happening. The energy of life is, is now moving around. Things are happening. Light has now been brought in to the universe. Verse 6, day 2. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. What is the firmament? Well, we get a really good idea here in verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So you have this blob of liquid, and God says, okay, let's put space in between the waters above and the waters beneath. Heaven, atmosphere, air, okay? There's a division between rivers, lakes, Seas. There were no land. There wasn't any land at this point. It's all water. So you have a globe of water. Keep that in mind for when we get to Genesis chapter six. A globe of water that now has a space in between the waters above and the waters beneath. You have what they call heaven. What God calls heaven: firmament, air, atmosphere. And after two days, that's what we have. Still pretty uninteresting of a, of a looking thing. Try to picture in your mind what that might have looked like. Now, you know, the artistic people, creative people could probably do a really good job of that. I'm not really creative that way, but it just looks kind of strange to me. All right, verse 9. Maybe some of you out there who are 
artist, maybe you could sketch it for us, and we'll put it up on the screen next week, all right? Get out your easel, make it look good for us, all right? Verse 9, and God said, third day, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. So now God says, here's what we're going to do. That space that's underneath, all that water that's under that, that first blob there, he says, let's gather all the water in one place and let's bring forth land. Let's have dry land appear. Boom. Boom. And dry land appears. Uh, It is what we learned in earth science, the one continent called Pangaea. One continent. The the earth started with one big blob of land, and then the rest of it was seas. That's what it says there. That's what happened on day three. One big continent and seas all surrounding it. So really, a giant island. And then water all around. And God said, that's good. Verse 11 says, uh, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So now, that blob that was just water has this big chunk of land on it, and now on this big chunk of land, we get green, grass, vegetation, produce, seeds, things bearing fruit and reproducing the seed after its kind. God saw it, and it was so, the Bible says it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and what did God say about it? It was good. And verse 13 tells us that the evening and the morning were the third day. So, just for a pause before we move on to day four and forward, I'm starting to get the sense here that I can take a literal day meaning. Here's why. Because if God can just speak light, and God can just speak a globe of water, and God can just speak and land appears, and grass and produce appear, if God can just talk and do that, Does omnipotence ever run out of energy? So would God need to be like, man, day two was tough. I'm going to have to take off a couple millennia till I get the energy to to start the grass. Now I know that's kind of an elementary thought and maybe what we would call basic, but I call it logic. If he's omnipotent, he doesn't get tired. If he's omnipotent, he could have said, and everything day one through six finished. He could have. Why did he do this? I don't know that we'll ever know that, his, all of his reasons for doing this. But I think because God is such a loving God and because he cares about us understanding him, that he puts things in terms that we can get. And you know what? Knowing the kind of people that we would be, knowing that right after creation that man would fall and all of Adam and Eve's descendants would be fallen people, God knew that we would have limits. He calls us dust. We were made out of the dust of the ground. He knows that we can't work like he can. He knows that we're not not omnipotent like he is. We, We have limits. We're going to get to the end of the week and go, man, I need a day. (laughs) And so I believe that the way that God, uh, part of the reason that God did this was so we could get it, just so we could understand. I mean, imagine that God who didn't have to do any of that said, because I want you to know me and understand me, I'm going to break this down at an elementary level. I don't have to, but I'm going to. Because I know your limits, and I know time is going to be something that you're going to need. You're going to have to learn how 
a day, a, a day is, is light and night is dark. And in that dark time, unless you work third shift or, or late second shift, that's when you, you rest. But really, you, you're going to need some, some things to break up because you're not omnipotent. You're going to need some stops, some rests, some pauses. And to put it into language that we could get and to put it in terms, not even words, but life that we can understand. I'm not doing a good job of articulating that, but um, I, think, I, I think that's one of the reasons that God does what he does. Because and, and, omnipotence doesn't have to stop. I think he does it so we can understand, so we can keep up. So we come to the fourth day, and this cadence of creation continues. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God said, let's have lights up there. So he gave us lights for seasons signs, days, and years. Again, God, who didn't need to do any of this, created these things to break things up so you and I could kind of get it, so that we could exist, so that we could understand and make it. Light for us, the daylight. Verse 16 puts it this way. It seems pretty... uh, Well, this might be a way you would describe it to a little child. And God made two big lights, right? Doesn't that sound like kind of a kid's Sunday school lesson? God made two big lights. Oh, you know. He made the biggest light, which is the, and all the kids yell, sun. And then he made a night light that is called the moon, right? It's it's fun how God kind of just gives this to us here. He made two big lights, one to rule the day and the lesser one to rule the night. So you got the sun, the big light that rules the day. The, the thickest clouds you could still see. Shade is great, but it doesn't cast out the sunlight. The sun is there for us to see. It's daylight. It's not just a beautiful thing to, to look at and to light everything up but it brings life, doesn't it? Brings light, life to us. I mean, think about the vitamins that we don't get when there's no sun. If you're like me, you feel it in the winter. There are people in our church, God loved them, and I mean this. In the winter, they check on me, and they'll say, how's your vitamin D? I appreciate that, because they know that I struggle with that in the, in the winter. Um, I even asked my doctor, I'm like, man, if I, can I go to a tanning bed, you know, <laughs> and, and will that give me the vitamin D? Could you imagine me walking in here in January, like glowing, you know, I'd be like, where's this guy been, you know, tanning bed, you know, but it's not for vanity, you know, I was like, man, if I can get some vitamin D out of that, I'll go to the tanning bed. He's like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, you need the sun, and that makes sense, you know, but if you're like me, man, you can feel it. You know when um, you're drained of that. And it, the sun gives life, and it brings so many other blessings to our world, uh, besides just warmth, right? Um, but then you got the moon that, that rules the night, and you know this. I'm such a dork. You, you know this. We've talked about it before. Verse 16, one of my favorite phrases in the Bible, he made the stars also. And, and we talked about this, and I'm going to say it again because it's the coolest thing in the world, and I drew it on the board for the students. It's a one with 21 zeros after it. That's how many stars we know of. And scientists will tell you there are more than that. This is just all we can get to at this point. A one with 21 zeros. That's how many stars we know of. And you know, that stat is actually like a year or two old. So by now, with all the uh, whatever they have, they may know of more now. But it makes me, it blows my mind that there's that many stars to begin with. And then we, when we read in the Psalms that he's named every one of them. Unreal. 
if that doesn't kind of give us a scale of God and us, we come to verse 17, and God set them in the firmament. He set them up in space of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So four days in, we finally have some shape, we have some growth, we have light, we have stars. This thing's starting to look beautiful. I mean, you've got grass, green grass, you've got the seas. I mean, sunsets now, sunrises, moonlight, stars, all of that. It's starting to really look good. Day five. And God said, verse 20, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. Now we pause because we're seeing this word kind. It's, it is coming up over and over in these last two verses, and we need to stop here because it's going to keep going as he talks about the other animals that he creates, but kind. Talked about it too with the, the, the herbs and, and all that, the produce. But we need to talk about kind because if you want to get someone who believes in evolution, if you want to put them... Uh, have them put the brakes on and, and start to fumble over their words. Ask them when it's ever been observed that one kind changed into another kind. Because they'll say, well, there's this bird that had this beak, and in over millions of years, the beak got longer and, and, and it curved in such a way that it could eat the the fruit out of this one tree that it eats. So that's evolution. That is not evolution. By definition, that is not evolution. That's not changing from one kind to another, like a blob to a tadpole to a frog to a monkey to a man. We have never observed anything like that, ever. And for something to be called science, Brother Larry could speak to this better than me, for something that could be called science, it has to be observable. And we've never observed one kind changing into another kind. Don't you love the fact that thousands of years before this century, and maybe hundreds of years, or you know, maybe a thousand years before you had skeptics, God said, checkmate because he recorded that when these animals kept reproducing they produced after their kind they didn't become something else entirely they might have adapted a little bit we have seen adaptation where an animal may you know change a little bit but it stays the same species We've seen that. We've observed that. That happens. But we've never observed anything go from one kind to another because it just doesn't happen. Because God's law says, God's law of life says, one kind will reproduce its kind. Period. I love the fact that we can just live on that. I I can go to bed tonight. I can lay my head on my pillow and not wonder that if I'm missing out. God just plainly says it, man clear. So we we can't skip over these things. We come to verse 22. And God blessed them. That's these creation of these uh, sea creatures and winged, winged fowl. He blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So day five, we get sea and air creatures. Great whales that God just created. All kinds of birds everywhere. And somewhere up north, God created Canadian geese. And we wonder why. (laughs) Right? 
if you live around any kind of pond or retention pond, and oh, it's a mess. But God's got his reasons. All right, we come to verse 24, sixth day. This is it. And God said, let the earth... Okay, that was weird. All right, that was really weird. No, that's all right. When, you, when I say God says and that happens, you know, I'm like, all right, what do you say? You know, like, whoo! All right. Man alive. Should we just pray or something? <laughs> Woo. All right. Anyway, day six, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Now, here we go. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. God said it. It was brought forth. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So now we have an earth filled with beauty. I mean, you think about all the animals that are out there and how cool they look and how weird they look and how different they are. Just cool stuff, right? And then we come to verse 26, and we are mentioned for the first time. It says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God says, Now we're going to make man. And this is going to be different than everything else we've created. Because this creation, this specific creation, is going to be made kind of after us, after the way that we think and the way that we communicate, and the emotions that we have. Those other things are different, but this one creation is going to be something that we can communicate with, and that we can, that will be, um, well, God says it best, made in our image, emotion, thought, logic. Okay? This is different. We notice the plural there. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. As uh, I guess the word is Trinitarian. Are we Trinitarian? We're Trinitarian, right? So we, we, I mean, I know we believe in the Trinity. I'm just talking about the word. Um, So as people who believe in the Trinity, we understand this to be God speaking of the three persons, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, we've seen in verses 1 and 2, God the Father and God the Spirit. We know that they were involved in creation right off the bat. And we won't turn there, but as a reference, John chapter 1 tells us the other us was the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing made, the Bible says. Nothing was made without Him. So we know that all three persons of the Trinity involved in creation, and they created man in their image. And then he says this. This is a difference. He's going to uh, make a, a difference in man and, and animals. He says, let them have dominion over the, fi- the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So different category. And this is why, um, I don't want to get too soapboxy here, but this is why I'm, I don't apologize, but for those who say that people and animals are equal, they're not. God has made a distinction. Now, a reasonable believer, and I think a reasonable person, would say, that of course doesn't give us the right to, you know, abuse animals and to whatever. I mean, we don't want to mistreat God's creation, of course, but there is a difference. Save the whales and stop abortion are not the same thing. If you want to save whales, save them, man. Okay? Like, I don't have a problem with that. But don't pretend like that's an equal endeavor. Okay? It's completely different. I'm okay with saving whales. I love God's creation. I don't think we should abuse animals. But there is a difference. There is a difference, clearly here. God did not say, let us make 
cattle and fish and fowl after our image. Completely different. So, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And again, we could stop here and we could get on a soapbox. But it is worth mentioning that when God created humans, he created male and female. Now, as, as strange as it seems to most of us in our society and world today, <clears throat> you know, there's all kinds of um, ideas, strange additions to two sexes. Um, and it's sin. There's no other way to say it. I mean, I, I, I hurt for those people because I think I know they need Jesus, so I hurt for them. I want them to know Jesus so they can know the freedom that we have in God to be happy with the way that God created us. I want that for them, but it is sin. Um, but God created everything so he gets to pick he gets to choose, and he gets to decide, he gets to uh, lay the law down on what is what, and God said when he created humans, he created male and female. That's it. And we can, you know what, people can and will try to change that and, and, and reason it and, and make all kinds of excuses for it, but it doesn't matter. God created male and female. And so verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And we go to verse 29, except for we don't, because a skeptic would say, stop for a second. If there were no people on the earth, why would God say, replenish. Because the way I think of replenish means restock, um, put back what we lost, inventory thinking, right? If you have 10 cans of green beans on the shelf and somebody buys seven, you replenish to get it back to 10, right? You, you put back what was already there. You, um, you add back what we lost, that's the way I think of the word replenish, and that is one definition of the word replenish. But if you look at a dictionary, this isn't like just, you know, the Bible dictionary. This is like if you look at a dictionary, human, or English language, replenish can mean produce supply. It doesn't have to mean redo it or put back what was lost. It can just mean produce supply as well. So there actually are two definitions for that. I banged my head against a wall for a long time about that. <clears throat> and I forget who, somewhere along the line, somebody explained that to me, and I looked it up, and sure enough. So, again, God doesn't, uh, God doesn't miss anything here. We do, but He doesn't. In verse 29, and we'll, we'll close chapter 1 out tonight. It says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is fruit, the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat or food. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat and it was so. So, interesting thing here. When we read at the end of verse 29 the word meat, and Because I, I told the young people in the class, I said, God made us, at first, we were all herbivores. Is that right? That means we only eat vegetation? Okay. So God made everything, made us all herbivores. We had all the green vegetables, produce, all that that was for us for food. It says meat. And one of the students said, well, it says meat. So God said that they could eat meat. And I said, well, that means food. It's just a different word for food. And I said, so yeah, God made us in the, crea in the beginning of creation we were herbivores, meaning we only ate vegetation, fruit, vegetables, things like that. Um, and that's how God intended it to be from the beginning. Verse 31, and God saw 
everything that he had made, and behold, it was, I love this, very good. So when he's finished with it all, after day six, he says, all that I've done, last six days, every day it was good, but when I look at all of it put together, it's very good. And I would agree with that, wouldn't you? I would, I would have to say amen to that. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So there it is. It's, it's all finished because we, we're going to get into it next week. Uh, maybe not next week because Lord's Supper, but soon we'll get into um, seventh day. God rested. And again, does omnipotence need to rest? That's not what it means. When it says God rested, it wasn't like he was like, Phew, that's good. I'm going to kick my feet up for a little bit. Okay. It wasn't that. It, was, it just means he stopped from his work. But six days, evening and the morning, the God, the omnipotent God of the universe, the king of the universe, speaks into creation all that we see, all that's around us. Now, for our closing, imagine, if you will, a beautiful sunset. We've had a bunch of them lately. I think even more lately, we've had incredible sunrises. Just, I mean, just this week driving um, Cross County Highway, you're driving to the west or east, yeah, man, pray for me, driving to the east, and, and right over, kind of like where, if you're coming down there, kind of like where Chipotle is, right over in that direction, the sun's coming up, and this week, it was pink, and purple, and orange, and like light blue, all in a row, and it was awesome, I, you can't take a good picture with your cell phone while you're driving, um, pro tip, so it doesn't work, but it was beautiful, Think about the, the, the awesome animals you see, just the, the different, like a giraffe, you know, a whale, some of the sea creatures, some of the, some of the bird, I mean, just some awesome stuff. And how about a beautiful yard when it's been cut and, and trimmed and manicured, right? Beautiful, right? The green, thick grass. Man, we, we, we have a beautiful, beautiful universe. You step outside, not tonight probably, but you step outside some nights and the stars, right? It is very good. Everything that God has made is very good. And his intentions was to create something just out of his pleasure. <laughs> He's just like, man, I like this. I want to do it. And he just created something for his pleasure. And you and I, and how many ever people and animals and whatever have been blessed to be a part of something God says, I just love that. And that's just the first six days. Now we know for the most part it kind of goes downhill from here until we get to the other hill, Calvary, when he redeems it all. So thanks be to God. Let's pray tonight. Father, thank you for this record. Lord, I'm so glad that you didn't make us guess and wonder. You didn't leave us with this really, um, it's a very important question, Lord. The, the question I think every person has, God, is where do I come from? And why does this matter? And if we didn't have this record of your love, of your power of your just omniscience and your wisdom and your, your greatness. We can't even put it in words. If we didn't have that record, Lord, of what you did to get this started and how you care about us and how you made us in your image, Lord, if we didn't have that, oh, life would be awful. Be awful. Not knowing where we came from, not knowing why we're here, just kind of going through this life feeling like maybe I'm a mistake, I'm an accident, it just so happens that I'm here. I can't imagine that existence, but Lord, thank you that you have recorded for us that it was all by your design and all for your pleasure. And Father, we pray that we wouldn't just take this information to, for head knowledge, but Lord, we would take it for knowing you and understanding you your power, your care. Lord, may it change our hearts. May it make a difference in our lives. 
knowing that we are made in your image, should produce in us an absolute good kind of pride that says, man, God loves me that much that it would inspire in us a heart to be image bearers that show to this world who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.